I'm delighted to say Keith Andrews is on the line for us this morning. Keith, how are you doing? More lads, how things? Yeah, very good, very good. The um, championship playoffs are in full swing. Um, West Brom, a former club of yours, uh, a little bit up against it against Villa tonight? Yeah, I think that's fair to say that. Um, the, the, sorry, the way they set up in the first game was, was all about containing, was all about playing like a, a system that was going to try and nullify what Villa had, mainly Grealish and McGinn in midfield. Um, played a 5 4 1 system, played very, very deep, looked dangerous on the counter. Like when you get your goal and you take the lead, then you have to say the game plan is working. But Conor Horan came on for Glenn Whelan, and, and then the game plan went out the window, really. Um, Conor's goal was made by Jack Grealish in particular because he attracted two, three bodies around him, created a little bit of space for for Connor and he finished it with some aplomb, didn't he? Yeah. Is, um, like if, if Villa were to go up, either way, you have to assume Jack Grealish is one of the hottest prospects in English football this summer and one of the most sought after. Yeah, I think take Liverpool and Man City out of the equation. I think he can play for any other Premier League team. I think he's that good. I think the talent has always been there. Board. And what you've had in the last 12 to 18 months, I would suggest, has been a professionalism around his game. And he seems to be taking it very, very seriously. You can even see in his body shape and how fit he is, how strong he is. Still picked up a little bit of a niggle, um, which sometimes obviously you can't do anything about. But I just think he's leaving, leading his life the right way. And the effects are, are, are spectacular. I think he's turning into quite a special player that we probably all assumed he would, but he is obviously came off that track once or twice with some, some off-field skirmishes. But, um, yeah, he's a smashing player, Jay. Yeah, yeah you, you get the sense that um, Villa will get one season out of him if they go up right now, but otherwise he'll be gone, right? Yeah, I, I, look, uh, only for the takeover last summer, he was gone. He was definitely gone. And James Chester of Alta would have been gone. That was lined up to go to Stoke for, for, a, for a decent amount of money. That's where they were financially. The takeover happened in the middle of pre-season and then the, the goalposts change. I think Jack Grealish doesn't have to go. He didn't particularly want to go. I don't think, from what I from what I hear, he's obviously Aston Villa through and through. So I think his genuine dream is to get Aston Villa back into the Premier League. And let's 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 not pull any punches. They are a major, major force in English football. They just need to take that step. But taking that step back into the Premier League clearly isn't that easy. The other uh, thing that we want to talk to you about this morning was Leeds and um, Derby. So Leeds um, have a one-nil lead after the the first leg, but you were kind of on this uh, train a long way back, even I think last October, November. Just that the intensity involved for Leeds was going to be very difficult for them to maintain over the course of the the absolute warfare that is the championship, and uh, you were dead right. Yeah, it's a war of attrition, isn't it? And I had concerns. I was blown away by what he achieved with that set of players. That set of players finished third game to last season. So when you add Patrick Bamford, Barry Douglas, the only two two real signings into that equation for, for financial um, for money. And they've been injured a large part of the season. So always had concerns about whether they can whether they'd be able to sustain it for a full season, mainly because of the training method. You know, the game in terms of the game that he wants to play, if you're resting in between, if you're taking things training wise moderate um, I think you can possibly sustain it, but they didn't. They lost 11 of the last 23 games in the league. Lost. They only had one point out of four going into the playoffs. So there was huge concern about what they would produce in the playoffs against the Derby team, who were playing very, very well. But to be fair to them, they were outstanding. I thought they controlled the game against Derby, bearing 10, 15 minutes at the start, and then possibly a little spell in the second half with Derby towards the end, or looking live. There's a few contentious refereeing decisions. Um, but no, I think Leeds are certainly in the driving force for, for tomorrow evening. Right, OK. Like, it, it, accepting the fact that they will probably make two or three signings at the very least, if they do get promoted, Keith, like, I think we're all attached to this nostalgic idea of Leeds United being back in the top tier. How long would they last up there? Oh, was it 15, 16 years the last time they were there? I think it's... When you look at both of them, look, obviously we've seen, we've seen a couple of comebacks in the last couple of weeks. We can't discard West Brom or Derby because I think they're, they're both capable. They have the personnel to... to to upset the, the apple cart, if you like. But I think when you're looking at it, the final, the playoff final, that most fans, most neutrals want will be Aston Villa against Leeds because they were two two teams. Anybody in and around my age would, would, would say they grew up supporting or following or knowing so much about Leeds and Aston Villa. They were always that club, probably below the, the main two, three, four clubs. And, and Villa at times, of course, were, were right up in the, in the equation for winning the Premier League right at the start. So I think Leeds... 
if they did get back up, I think the, the infrastructure is certainly there. We know the fan base is there. But of course, the same can be said about Aston Villa. Yeah. Uh, at this stage, who do you think is actually the most likely team to go up? I think it's going to be a Villa Leeds final. And I think if, if Leeds bring that A game, I think it beats Villa's A game. But I'm not sure they have their A game left. I was, I was impressed with them at the weekend against Derby. But it still wasn't the scintillating, free-flowing, absolute control of a football game that they've been seen for the first three, four, five months of the season until they hit that rut and they couldn't seem to finish teams off. They've had an issue in both the boxes. Defensively, they haven't been as good. And at the, at the opposite end, um, Kimai Roof coming back is going to be a massive, massive plus for them. But they haven't been as clinical as they, as they were in the early parts of the season. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a, a remarkable few weeks for football, but I think at this time of the year, everybody would do well to remember the second legs of the championship playoff and then the playoff final at Wembley tends to produce some of the most exciting, batshit crazy football that you see year after year. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're bonkers. Like they really are because it, like there's so many scenarios in place that if you do go up your personal contract it goes up or it stays the same players will want to leave if, if they don't if they don't get promoted some will, will still want to leave I think West, West Brom is a prime example of that obviously got relegated last season they come down and it, it's, I think it's fairly evident that some of the players don't really want to be there and I think it's been a shame I think Darren Moore has paid the, paid the price for that in a way and then obviously the football club the backroom team you know the, the Villa were in such financial trouble up until that takeover. So last year you felt it was now and ever so then it was going to be a complete rebuild. Obviously the takeover happens, they can go again and they, they have the financial muscle to be able to compete in the market. But there's so many ramifications. Um, it, it, they are intriguing games and, and certainly the finals, You can, when you're at them, you can sense the edginess, you can sense the nerves. It's not like a, a normal cup final. They really are a bit different. Keith, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, Nathan Murphy has a, a trophy that he hands out every year. It's called the uh, the Green Boot or the Emerald Boot. We haven't decided which yet. It's for the uh, top scorer in the Premier League who's Irish. And this year, unfortunately, it was uh, shared by the two Shane, Shane Duffy and Shane Long with uh, five goals each. With 23 goals, I think, in the Premier League this year, which was a vast improvement on last year. So um, things are at least trending in the right direction. But the point he was making generally was that um, the quality of football that we're seeing in the Premier League has got better and better and better year on year as the money has come in and as the league has improved versus the other leagues around the world. So they can sign the best players from the small, mid-ranking Serie A, um, La Liga and German clubs. And that what we should really be doing is praising anybody who is able to, at this point, maintain a Premier League existence and a contract and a career who is Irish because the competition is so fierce. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point um, that Nathan's made, which is unusual for Nathan, to be fair. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you factor in all those scout networks and where they can go and shop now, I think he's hit the nail on the head. I've said it before numerous times. It's never been as hard, firstly, to make it as a professional footballer because of that competitive nature of, of the industry and um, how far and wide they can stretch, but also to sustain it at the top level. So we, we look, it's been well documented about the players, or the lack of players that we have playing at, at Premier League level. Of course, next year we'll have Sheffield United, two to three players. If Aston Villa go up, there's another couple. Um, so yeah, look, it's, it's not easy. Um, but if it, if it goes to the side, I'll give it to Shane Duffy because he is centre half. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what was your view on uh, what Dave McIntyre said about Man United and um, the fact that Solskjaer is a manager who, at this stage, they're not really sure that they want? They really have to double down now and back him, or do they have immediate buyer's remorse and decide, OK, we made a mistake, I'm sure there's some get-out clause early on in that contract, that there's still a possibility they could get somebody who is better and more qualified, somebody like Mauricio Pochettino, who's still making noises that unless the money's coming... Uh, through from Spurs next year, that he, he could have his head turned. Yeah, I think they've got serious financial clout. clout. Um, I don't think that's, that's a problem for them, but I think if they did get rid of Solskjaer, it'd be very, very embarrassing. But do you persevere with someone who is maybe just starting to look out of his depth, or do you flip it on its head and go, well, maybe Jose Mourinho had a point? And I certainly didn't think he had at the time. I thought these players were capable of so much more than what they were producing under Jose Mourinho. But maybe he did have a point. There's obviously clear, clear issues. The dressing room needs to be absolutely gutted. So whatever issues are in that dressing room need to be sorted out. 
big players, big egos, big personalities, if they're not rowing in the same direction as the manager and the football club, they quite simply need to go. We've said this probably a couple of times at least since Alex Ferguson left the building, that they have to press the reset button. They need to stop chasing the Alex Ferguson dream because it's not going to happen again. But what they need to do is all get in sync with where they're going as a football club. And I don't think that's happening at the moment. So there's some big, big calls to be um, had over the summer. Like, at what point do you think that the Solskjaer reign will come to an end? Because it's almost accepted at this point that he's uh, right up there in terms of the most likely to be sacked first next season, which seems like an extraordinary thing to say, given how he started his reign as United boss. Yeah, it's, it's bonkers, Owen, isn't it? It's, I mean, you only go back for whatever it was, six, eight weeks, now you think, wow, look at what he has produced with this set of players. Look at the run, look at the style of football. They're playing on the front, they're playing attacking football, they're playing with real pace and energy. Something that most of us have been crying out for and, and thinking that Martial and Rashford and Lukaku to the degree that they are capable of this type of football if given a little bit of confidence by the manager. But it's been very alarming what's happened. Um, and obviously, he is the head honcho, he is in charge of that group of players. But those players, there's serious issues there in that dressing room. So it, it's, it's a massive call. And Look, football's a mad world. We've seen Chris Hewton yesterday go and people were pointed a record over the last, whatever it was, three wins in 23. But it's, it's the type of industry where, OK, we'll talk about it, we'll discuss it for a couple of days, but we quickly move on and Pochettino could well and truly be in the seat within a week or two. Probably not before the Champions League final. <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of the Brighton decision? Uh, very surprised, initially. Uh, we're on the pro license here at the moment, and one of the lads just said, "Wow, Chris Hewton's just been sacked." And I just thought, "Jesus!" Like the day after the game, that is like that's just not messing it out. I spent time at Brighton. I, I nearly stayed as a, as a coach towards the latter stages of my career. It didn't quite work out. And the owner is very, very ambitious. He probably wasn't content with what um, what they've done this season. And I think when you throw Dan Ashworth into the equation who's come from being the FA technical director. He arrived in the in building at Brighton in January. Straight away, I'm thinking, what is he going to add to the equation? I think he'll definitely improve the recruitment side of things because I don't think that has worked in the last couple of years. It was even an issue when I was playing there. Some of the players that they've signed for substantial fees, you would have to say, quite simply haven't worked. And it's been the kind of same old faces, some of which have got them promoted, kept them in the league and kept them going. But you do need to add quality. And when your signings don't work, especially with the ones that you spend some serious money on, then obviously you live and die by those. And I, I, I'm not so sure Chris even had final say on some of those signings. So I, I would imagine that would be a disappointing part of him. Yeah. One last thing I just wanted to, uh, to bring up with you. I know you, um, you were obviously at Bolton uh, for a, a good stretch there at the end of your career. Um, they're going to start in League One with a 12-point deduction next year after uh, going into administration, it kind of is the final nail in the coffin for that club. Yeah, it's, look, I have to be completely honest. Yeah, when I when I walked in there, I signed a three-year deal after the Euros in 2012. And after my first training session, I was thinking, oh dear, oh dear, what have I walked into? It was just not right. The, the habits of the football club, it was on a massive downward spiral. It had already started. It had just been relegated from the Premier League. And everybody assumed championship football was not. Nah, this, this will be a problem. We'll just get straight back up. It's the mentality of the football club. Since then, the, the types of contracts that they've thrown out, um, it's it's just spoiled out of control year on year. The, the owner that's been in place, Ken Anderson, the way he conducts himself is not particularly nice. I don't think it's very transparent. Takeover, even that muddy water over the takeover with Bassini in recent weeks, the EFL, he's been banned himself. He's just come out of a of a ban from football, a three-year ban from his dealings with Watford. And, um, it's a complete mess because you would have to say that it is one of the the old, traditional, historic football clubs in Northern England. And, and certainly the fans don't deserve what's gone on, but it's it's been an absolute... I don't know how Phil Parkinson, the manager, has dealt with this. I, know, I still know a couple of the players there and it's been one thing after another, you know, not getting paid, you know, the, the whole... the whole messiness of it. And... For them to even, firstly, to kept them up last season, and this season just gone, obviously he couldn't quite do it, but he's got to be in serious need of counselling that fella after what he's had to endure at that place. 
When you went in there first, like Keith, you said you kind of realised it was bad straight away. What sort of things did you see? What was the tangible thing that suggested that to you? Habits, Owen, were the big thing. Um, bad habits. So I'd gone from West Brom under Roy Hodgson, where everything was meticulous. The football club was run very, very well. Ironically, at that, that time, Dan Ashwood was the technical director at, at West Brom um, under Roy Hodgson. So it's like you're talking to people there that are experts in their field. And that just fed right down into the player. The type of dressing room we had at West Brom was very professional. Took pride in what we did. Um, you flipped that on its head. And we, I walked into Bolton and it was like walking into Billy Smart Circus. It was just like a, a boys club. It was just a bit of a, a laugh and a joke training uh, around the place. And it was it was very evident that there was, there was issues at the football club. Look, we'll wrap it up there. Enjoy the rest of uh, your course. How is the pro license? Is it, are you a good student, Keith? What do you think, Jay? I'd say you're diligent and hardworking. When you bought it coming in on Thursday. I'd say you're diligent and hardworking. You brought donuts for everybody, but then you were down in the back of the class making, making wise. <laughs> That's not too far off, actually, <laughs> without the donuts. Uh, no, it's been going well. It's, it's day two now. But I'm flying off to um, West Brom Villa tonight. I'll be at the game tonight after they won the two, two semi-finals. So I'm busy tonight. I'll be back in time for my class tomorrow morning. So now it's been good. We've, we get various um, speakers in, very talkers, long days. We've got a presentation on now at 10 o'clock. Uh, my slot is at 10 o'clock, but I'll be down in the classroom for nine. So, yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to go down and get some eggs and toast beforehand. Enjoy it. Best of luck, Keith. Thanks a million, man. Cheers, lads. Good speaking.